Hello, welcome to this event about far right, the far right and climate change. My name is Sam Moore. I'm going to be kind of hosting uh, for tonight. And we're extremely happy to be here with uh, Andreas Malm, Laudi van der Ervel, and Alex Roberts. So I'm going to introduce them a bit more. Um, Andreas Malm is one of the foremost thinkers, uh, Marxist thinkers in particular in the world today. Uh, he's also uh, an associate professor in the Department of Human Geography at Lund University, and the author of many, many books, uh, including Fossil Capital, The Progress of the Storm, Corona, Climate and Chronic Emergency, uh, and of course, the very famous How to Blow Up a Pipeline. He's also currently working on a book project called Follow the River, which is a people's history of the wilderness, which maybe I'll ask a few questions about tonight. And the book we're going to be talking about that Andreas co-wrote tonight is White Skin, Black Fuel, which came out last year, May 2021, from Verso. I should say all the other books that Andreas has written there are also from Verso as well. We're very happy also to be with Laudi van der Ervel, who works as a teacher at Maastricht University within the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, and she mostly teaches courses in political philosophy. Alex Roberts and Sam Moore, so that's someone else and me, uh, are writers and researchers. Uh, we are the hosts of a podcast called 12 Rules for What, which is like a, a Lil John meme and a Jordan Peterson book, and the authors of two books, Post-Internet Far Right, from Dog Section Press last year, 2021, and The Rise of Ecofascism, which is the other book we're going to be talking about tonight uh, from Polity. So the, the kind of the eagle-eyed or the eagle-brained amongst you would have noticed that I am both uh, fulfilling the function of host and also one of the authors of one of the books. Um, there's a famous, I guess, Zizek bit where he is um, talking on and on and on and on and on and the moderator is trying to get him to stop and go to audience questions. And he says, fine, I'll stop uh, on the condition that I can choose who asks the first question. And the moderator says, okay, fine, that's fine by me. And uh, he says, okay, I nominate Zizek and I'm going to ask this question to Zizek and the question is, Zizek, what would you have said had you had more time? So I'm gonna try and avoid that kind of general vibe, um, but we are gonna kind of, uh, I'm gonna be involved in the conversation and then ultimately over the course of the conversation, it will go in directions that I can't predict. And hopefully I will you know, wither away like the, uh, like the state. And so tonight we're talking about the climate change and the far right and the two different ideas of that problem that these two books have. White Skin, Black Fuel is a discussion of the far right in the climate crisis, which charts the connection between denialism and fossil fuel infrastructure, mediated through things like the far right, ideas of, of, ideas of whiteness, ideas of the natural hierarchy of races, and so on. So we're going to be thinking about how that connection operates. Why is it that far right parties, by and large, have adopted a kind of denialist outlook on climate change? Is that ever going to change? And why is that connection so strong if it isn't? The rise of ecofascism, on the other hand, is about, in some ways, the opposite side of that equation, about the utilization of environmental thought by the far right. Although, like both books, both books kind of cross over that distinction. It's not that one side thinks that the far right is denialist, the other side thinks that the far right isn't denialist. There are deeper forms of denialism. There's much more complicated stuff going on, but hopefully that'll all come out in the discussion that we're about to have. So the first question I want to ask is to Andreas and to Laudi. I should say both of them are members of the Zetkin Collective, which is this uh, group that has written this book together. Um, the first question is to Laudi and Andreas. How do you see the connection between denialism and the far right? Why is there such a robust connection? And what is this, why is there this connection at all between these two different aspects of, uh, of politics, which on the surface, don't seem like they'd be obvious bedfellows, although they have been historically. But why is it that there is such a profound connection between the politics of the far right and climate change denialism? Would you like to kick off, Andreas? Oh, you go, Lani. No, you go. Please go ahead. <laughs> and I get then I get time to think. Okay. Well, <clears throat> I mean, this is a very big question, and uh, our book is an attempt to grapple with this question on many different layers going back in history, back into the 19th century, the 20th century, and the contemporary period as well. And um, mm, some of these trends are pretty conjunctural. And when we wrote our book, this um, 
wave of, uh, shall we put it, shall we call it late far right climate denialism reached a kind of crest with uh, Trump in power in the US and Bolsonaro in Brazil. Uh, since then, obviously, Trump has left office. And uh, there is a general feeling that things have sort of shifted to the center with Joe Biden. Um, but I do think that we are looking at a potential resurgence of the Republicans in the US with uh, signs that the Democrats will perform very badly in, in the upcoming elections and that it isn't entirely unlikely that Trump will be the next president of the United States. And then the pendulum might very well swing back. There are no indications that the Republican Party has cut its ties or its deep commitments to the denial of anthropogenic climate change. And any, any potential Republican president in the US uh, that you can think of now at this moment would be a committed climate denialist. So um, it, it, again, it's not improbable that you'll see uh, a resurgence of this kind of force that seems to have nine lives at its disposal at the least. Um, and, and in the US, the um, uh, a second Trump term or the equivalent would, I think, act from a position of strength in the sense that the oil companies, oil and gas companies in the US that make up a kind of material backbone of the Republican far right are doing incredibly well financially uh, because of the windfall of profits that we've seen in the past year um and uh, uh, yeah i mean this is obviously a speculation but i think and it, it's not an answer to the question because it's very difficult to give one simple answer to the question of what's the link between the far right and climate denial it's more to say that this constellation of forces uh, of a of a us-led far right with very close ties to oil and gas companies and um, uh, committed, deeply committed to climate denial, still hasn't uh, run out of steam. It might very well come back to haunt us in the coming years. Yeah, and I think we can add also to that. Uh, in the book, we start off by explaining a bit of the history of environmentalism and, you know, uh, how it actually evolved over time. And I think one of the most important things is also that, you know, climate change at a, at a certain point, it became obvious that it was a problem. And at a certain point, it became connected to the idea of environmental justice like it's not only our problem it's the whole world's problem and we have to make sure that we do not only care about ourselves to that extent but also for the people that actually will have the effects uh, more than we probably will so the people in the global south and i think also there is where it started that you know it started to be something off the left like climate change so the right obviously i think it could be then logical to think that the best answer to this in in the first place is to deny that it actually exists just as an opposal to that yeah i think that's very important that's very kind of uh, useful to to see in the ways in which the the politicization of climate change to some extent led to the far its natural position uh being a denialist of it but nevertheless there is a kind of a something deeper that structures the far right's tendency and that is in the the title of the book which is white skin black fuel which is a title i find very provocative right it's based on a, a kind of a flip of a phenon text um there is a kind of a connection made here between like whiteness in general and fossil fuels infrastructure in particular and i want to kind of like suggest could you just like spell that out for us a little bit? And then I'm going to go to Alex for a kind of like a different story of how whiteness is being related to, to nature, not through fossil fuels, but through the idea of um, giving order to, but also being in harmony with, with nature in other ways. Laura, do you want to go or shall I? I if you have your answer ready. I, <laughs> You're faster I than me. Uh, again, I don't. I don't think there is a ready-made answer to this question because it's it's a it's a big, complex set of links that we need to explore, and we're just sort of scratching the surface in our book. Uh, but the the historical argument is that something critical happened in the 19th century with the uh, 
crystallization or if you like fossilization or petrification of something like whiteness as a particular position in a racially structured world economy. And this process is very difficult to separate from the emergence of a technological complex based on steam power, that is on coal. And uh, this historical moment, uh, we are really just exploring uh, at the surface and there's, there's so much more that needs to be examined here. But it seems to have created an enduring connection between um, uh, ideas of whiteness and uh, um, advanced civilization and um, technologies for mastering nature that crop up in different places. So I can just refer to a paper that one member of the Zetkin Collective has uh, recently written and submitted on the Australian far right, where the Australian far right is very aggressively promoting the idea that white people are superior because we rule nature by means of all of these advanced technologies that we have brought with us from the metropolis. Uh, obviously, this is special in, in the Australian context, uh, which is all about a settler colonial uh, project, but it, it has very clear uh, l connections to the original 19th century story of white people becoming ascendant thanks to the powers of uh, machines that run on fossil fuels. Um, I, I, this is not to suggest that this is the single key to the position of whiteness, but there seems to be some nexus here that plays a rather pernicious political role in the present. Yeah, so basically it's uh, very in simple terms, uh, much of it has to do with colonialism, right? Uh, with white people going to the Africas and claiming that they have to civilize these primitive, uh, primitive people. Uh, and I think it's still to that extent, well, in terms of post-colonial theories, uh, very prevalent. And indeed, as Andreas already said, uh, the white people going to the Africas to exploit um, their lands, um, coming with um, their technologies and basically gaining lots of power, still using that power. So, yeah. I think maybe there's a so like I I would totally situate uh, the, uh, the these dynamics in the 19th century or maybe from slightly early 18th century 17th century perhaps um, in the in 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 our book we do talk about exactly that kind of colonial project but we also yeah. see the the flip side to some extent of that colonial project as being about the assertion of a certain harmony between. Uh, the the certain nation it's not necessarily just whiteness it's often frenchness or englishness or germanness as well it's not as um, homogenized at that point um europeanness is is christendom rather than you know uh, europe but this is a kind of well-known history so there's a kind of a um uh, an assertion of a connection to nature that is not about necessarily its domination but that is about the capacity to kind of work through it seamlessly or something else and the concept that we use to describe this is far-right ecologism so we're thinking about the ways in which um, ecologism, which is a very broad uh, collection of ideas and practices in nature, gets structured around certain um, racial forms. So fire ecologism is the attempt to produce or deepen racial hierarchies in and through natural systems. Right? That's the kind of a pithy definition that we give in there. And it seems to me that maybe there's a kind of a, a kind of contradiction and the parts that you guys are talking to is one part of that contradiction and the parts that we're talking to are the other part of the contradiction. And this contradiction structures the whole of the far right in relation to climate change. And that contradiction is between, on the one hand, capitalism's need to expand around the world, put nature to work in more and more kind of um, different ways and more and more expansive ways all the time. And in doing so, inevitably destroy parts of it. So that's one dynamic of capitalism. And the other dynamic is to produce things like the nation state, the idea of homogenized races and so on, in order to justify the mode of exploitation but this mode of like justification paradoxically involves not just the exploitation of nature, but also assertions of community with nature or communion with nature, harmony with it in a certain locale and so on. And so you get things like the Volkisch movement in, in Germany, right, which asserts a certain kind of identity between the peasantry and the land, or you, know, you get lots of other kind of movements as well. And so maybe, maybe 
both of our projects are kind of situated around this contradiction. And this is perhaps a kind of unified framework we're thinking about how it is that the far right relates to not just climate change, but environmentalism more generally. And I wonder maybe, Alex, if you could give us some sort of like concrete examples, <laughs> because I've kind of sketched a very broad uh, collection of uh, kind of theoretical ideas there. Like, what kind of concrete examples do we give in the book that, you know, give a, give a kind of a, a life to um, the, these, these ideas that people live in particular, pe different people live in certain relationships to nature, some more harmonious, some more pure than others? So there's a, there's a few, few narratives that we, we sketch out in the history section of our book. And I think one of the, I think most important ones is that of race science, um, which is, you know, it's an idea that's founded within a kind of normally scientific framework, which is obviously a load of nonsense. And it, um, and you can see this re being recurring throughout our history as well. Um, a good case of it is in an example we talk about extensively, that of Madison Grant, who, who thought that white people, Nordics, as he referred to him in his framework, um, had a certain right to conquering, like a, fr a frontier spirit, which justified their existence in America, justified the management of land and justified the destruction of natural environment as well, along with its preservation and responsibility pr to preserve. And there's also this, this idea that in this race science aspect, there's a mystical element too that comes in. The idea of that one particular race is, is suited to a particular area and therefore um, is in harmony with that area, with that landscape, with that you know climate or whatever, and it therefore has a natural right to be there. And we have this kind of separating out of people. Um, but if I could just go back to the the uh, initial question about denial and, sure, okay, sure. and whiteness, of course, if we think about the effects of the crisis, it's, you know, people think about the climate crisis as a global thing, and it is, but it's also a very uneven crisis. And, you know, I've said this, made this point quite a lot. You've, you've heard me say this point quite a lot in these in our promo for our book. But, you know, um, Western countries the West are going to um, they're largely going to experience the climate crisis last and least, you know, uh, in the UK where, where we're, we're based, you know, we're kind of almost uniquely placed to ride out the climate crisis for us uh, for a good period of time. Whereas in other areas in the global South, the world, however you want to say it, um, are being affected and are being heavily disrupted and having uh, environments made in, in hospitable right now. And so denial is a way of extending out um, profit the extraction of profit, um, whilst and it, and the spit, the uneven, unevenness of the crisis, the fact that it's happening someplace and not happening where you know capital is based, gives the breathing room for denial to stretch out um, the further exploitation of the natural resources. Yeah, I think that's a really good, really good point. I kind of I want to shift back to Andreas and and, and Laudi now and ask what they make of the idea of a, a kind of natural harmony. Do, is that an important part of far right thought, or is ultimately the imperative to accumulate capital, the imperative to put nature to work, the imperative to accumulate uh, fossil fuel infrastructure and so on, and you know uh, accumulate capital? Are the, will those imperatives ultimately win out in the long term? And so these kind of spiritualist dimensions or these kind of nationalist dimensions, this kind of, you might, I mean, the very clunky Marxist terminology describes a kind of superstructural element, like will they inevitably be washed away by uh, the progress of, of capital accumulation? Well, if I can start on that, I think, because uh, you you talked about, you know, the, the Nazi period and actually our book also has a very huge um what is it called chapter on that and i think what gets clear in that chapter is that indeed there is this tension going on um which is actually a tension between you know exploitation on the one hand side and indeed like this community and and, and connection to nature on the other side but that this connection to nature is mostly a rhetorical tool and even though the ideas and maybe you know some practices were there in the end like at the end of the day, it was still exploitation that won. So to that extent, the far right in history hasn't really shown to be environmentalist to that extent. And also that I think, you know, in our book, we, we at least try to show that um, the far right is so tight to the fossil fuel industry that in fact, all they stand for at the end of the day is business as usual. So there is a 
place where we start talking about the possibilities of teaming up of the environmentalist um, um, yeah, advocates with the far right, which is, of course, more what your book does. But I think that's a very, very scary idea, actually, if that starts to happen. And I think Andreas has some very interesting insights to add there. <laughs> Well, well, in direct response to your question, I think that the idea of, um, and the, of a sort of intrinsic bond between the white nation and the land, the soil, and nature, is obviously extremely central to far-right thinking mm -hmm. uh, and has been so for a long, long time. The question is, what 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 is likely to happen with that bond or that, that sort of complex of ideas in the in the near future well one one obvious scenario is that you, you get more of the sort of survivalist prepper localist uh, or to some extent accelerationist fringe eco-fascists if you like i mean the kind of uh, brendan tarrant school of eco-fascism <clears throat> which can evidently claim a lot of people's lives and be extremely lethal and uh, belligerent but if, in if if we regard fascism as successful in historical moments where it can team up with dominant classes and that's this is sort of key to our understanding of fascism in our book then i i would rather think that some other scenarios are more likely and to an extent more dangerous and i'm thinking here of a far right that doesn't deny the climate crisis but that accepts its real existence and that purports to combat it in one form or another, and that has a potential to uh, form alliances with at least fractions of the dominant classes or segments of, of the elites or how, however you want to put it. And just to speculate a little bit, I, I see three three scenarios here. And again, I want to stress that all of the all of this, all of these kind of politics is extremely conjunctural. And after we had finished our book, uh, the pandemic broke out. And after the pandemic started to wind down, we now have the war in Europe. And these two disasters have overshadowed, to an extent, the climate crisis that was on the top of the political agenda in Europe in 2018 and 2019. But we know virtually for a certainty that the climate crisis will erupt and explode again and reassert its primacy. Uh, although perhaps mixed with all of the other shit storms going around the, uh, the planet. Uh, but it, it, when, when, when the climate crisis deepens further and uh, returns to the top of the political agenda, you can see um, uh, a non-denialist, sort of environmentalist in some sense, far right, coming to the fore that one, advocates for a nationalist kind of adaptation to climate impacts. And we saw signs of this sort of discourse prefigured last summer when we had some really bad climate disasters in Europe. And you had mainstream politicians like Angela Merkel talking about Germany being a strong nation that can withstand the forces of nature and, and beat them back. And here the mastery of nature is somehow fused with, of course, an acceptance of, of the climate crisis as reality. And here you can see uh, openings for a far right take on the climate crisis, as in we are a strong nation and we're going to protect ourselves against these disasters that befall us. And this can go hand in hand with protection, of course, uh, against uh, so-called foreigners, immigrants with border uh, controls and things like that. So muscular nationalist adaptation. Second, I think that uh, we can see a kind of environmentalist far right that is quite eco-modernist and techno-optimist and even techno-boosterist in some respects that has a potential to, again, team up with segments of the dominant classes. And in the discussion around energy sources, the far right tends to be very much infatuated with nuclear power. And we have a, a comrade in the Zetkin Collective who's right now doing the first, I think, systematic research into how the far right uh, is in love with nuclear power, focusing on the case of France, which is obviously crucial to this. But this is a phenomenon that you can find all across Europe, including in, in Sweden, where I'm living. And uh, the far right is very hostile to wind power, 
and you can see a kind of environmentalist far right in the struggle around the energy transition having a role to play in in championing nuclear power as the path forward third uh, inevitably questions around carbon dioxide removal and solar geoengineering will more and more come to the fore and uh, we've seen already signs of some far right figures such as donald trump and nigel farage warming to the idea of having massive reforestation as a way to draw down carbon dioxide what we have yet to see is a far right that explicitly advocates solar geoengineering as the antidote to the climate crisis but uh, that's a scenario that I wouldn't like to exclude because there is a logic to it, including the military nature of any solar geoengineering enterprise. And the current conjuncture seems to be one where we are having increased militarization of politics, not least in Europe, and with the uh, intensifying inter-imperialist rivalries between the US, China, Russia, you can, you can envision a, a far right or a trend towards the far right that is in line with, with national uh, militarism and that uh, promotes certain kind of technologies for dealing with the climate crisis along the lines of solar geoengineering or certain fine forms of, of carbon dioxide removal. Now, again, these are just speculations, but I think when we think of eco-fascism or an environmentalist far right, it might be fruitful to broaden to broaden that perspective out from, you know, the classical blot and borden uh, sort of dare Nazi uh, heritage, because that might not be what's most dangerous in the coming years. I am uh, thrilled to hear you say that, Andreas, because that's exactly what we argue in our book. <laughs> So we, we 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 have this thing called uh, the, the, the future that we argue is for is is batteries, bombs, and borders. So we have three parts there. The, the batteries are a um, kind of a lithium ion extraction uh, coupled properly to nuclear power, that kind of thing. Uh, the bombs is that we see this not as an expansion of a kind of classical fascist ideas, but more importantly of a kind of neoconservatism, a neoconservatism that instead of propagating democracy. Uh, or you know, using that as its kind of um, justification, instead propagates kind of environmental control as uh, its its main uh, justification on a global scale. We saw uh, kind of, I guess, elements of this in the early 90s when the US military, for example, was trying to work out what to do with all of the uh, enormous collection of um, military hardware that it had produced for the Cold War and then needed something else to uh, use it for, basically. And one of the propositions was uh, that it would go towards a kind of a, uh, a forms of environmental control. So I think that could definitely return as an idea. And then the, the last one is, of course, borders, which is this kind of um, nativist restriction on movements, nativist assertion of a unified people. Um, I think that's probably, as you say, more likely to emerge from a kind of a, uh, a broader, more expansive definition of the far right that includes things like neoconservatism and um, and that kind of movement than from classical fascism, which I think is, is quite dogmatic and um, yeah, probably more likely to stay uh, in some form of denialism over the long run, apart from, as you note again, the very fringe edges, which is what we call climate collapse cults, which are these kind of neo-Nazi groups that are likely to kind of, you know, um, uh, in defense of nature ostensibly, um, commit acts of, of uh, you know, terrorism in various forms. And so the danger that we identify in the book is not of ecofascism. The book, even though it's called The Rise of Ecofascism, is not really about that. The danger we identify in the book is that these things might emerge separately, but also that they might give space to or allow for the furtherance of, of each other's projects. So there's a kind of a, um, there are modes in which these two, these different projects emerge and they are contradictory. And there are modes in which they emerge and they are um, they are um, sorry. Um, they they allow each other to to be reproduced. But yeah, I, I think we agree basically yeah. on the dynamics of the of the future there, um, which is good to hear. Um, I want to talk to. I want to ask a question of 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 of, of Alex now, um, because we were talking a little bit about the difference between, um, in some ways, that there's there's a, there's a possibility for a far, there's although it seems like the far right is inflexible on the matter of mitigation it's less likely to be inflexible on the matter of adaptation, right? So the classical distinction, 
mitigation is the uh, attempt to limit the amount of carbon that goes into the atmosphere or other greenhouse gases or other forms of climate change. Adaptation is how you deal with the effects of having done that in the past, right? So even though we're not seeing a kind of a politics of mitigation come out of the far right necessarily or very much, we might see a politics of, of adaptation. And I wonder if you could kind of sketch out, Alex, like a few of the, the ways in which that might appear, like what might adaptation look like uh, from a far right perspective? So when we're distinguishing mitigation and adaptation, I think the far right is contesting mitigation in its denialism, in its kind of in its kind of campaign. Yes, yes capital. exactly. Yeah, yeah. Capital. Um, and it, I, we could say that, make that very, very clear. In adaptation, we can see certain um, solutions to the climate to the growing climate crisis that are, that are presented, which are particularly amenable to the far right. You know, a military further militarization of Europe's borders, for example is seemingly a kind of inevitable call from the from the far right in Europe um, in response to, you know, growing as, you know, um, land in the global south becomes inhabitable, um, you know, there'll be in, an increase in climate refugees and climate migration, and therefore, you know, we'll see um, a, 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 on a governmental level a clamping down on, on immigration even more. And we can see even now, um, for example, uh, uh, the nationality and borders bill uh, broken by the Tories government, which is not Tories aren't far right, but they, don't, you know, we don't. These kind of authoritarian measures don't have to come from the far right, and they're equally dangerous coming from whatever source, you know. Um, it's one example. You know, we just had the really shocking plan um, from the Tories to uh, to 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 open um, to ship people to Rwanda um, instead of you know accommodating them in the UK. And we can also see in the movement, there's a, in, in our book, we identify a tendency of far right movements um, to press for the furtherance of state power. So rather than looking to usurp state power as in, uh, as, as in history, they seek to um, pressure the state into fulfilling its you know, nominal obligations. And so we see generation, for example, the now defunct generation identity um, run a kind of paramilitary, uh, Para state, I wouldn't say paramilitary, um, border um, operation with their kind of defend Europe birth in the Mediterranean. Um, we could also saw them do this to the, uh, the, the French Alps. And uh, more concretely than that, in Greece, there has been examples of kind of far right uh, pressure on refugee refugee solidarity projects. And in, in Calais as well, for example, um, these can only increase. And you know, with, there is this metaphor which is uh, uh, used by a really horrible guy called Garrett Hardin, who's wrote the tragedy of the Commons. The idea of the armed lifeboat or lifeboat ethics, in which um, you know there's only a certain amount of room on uh, increasingly uh, you know habitable land, and therefore we need to militarize that land and keep enough people out so that the rest of the residents can stay safe. And I think the the politics of life, but ethics are going to be more and more pressing uh, as the decade rolls on. Yeah, I, I think that's really really important. And um, I have a question, kind of, for everyone now. Uh, so th th this question is about the, um, and I don't know the answer to this question. So I want to kind of uh, throw it out there and see if anyone has any kind of things that they want to say about it. We've seen a tendency towards what's called asset manager capitalism. So asset manager capitalism is um, a tendency towards further centralization of the ownership of capital. So it used to be that many stocks and shares were owned by um, firstly private investors, but also things like pension funds as well, where they were nominally invested uh, in people, um, in people's kind of livelihoods after they retire, right? So there was a kind of a connection there between people, uh, kind of most people who have, you know, people who have pensions and, um, and, and think further into capital. Asset manager capital, means that there are now companies like BlackRock and Vanguard and so on, which have trillions of dollars of assets. I think BlackRock at last count have $9 trillion of assets, which uh, I think is something like twice the GDP of the UK or something. So absolutely enormous uh, companies. And in, in both of our books, we talk about there being fractions of capital, right? We talk about there being particular capitalist interests that have certain forms of political expression, right? So it's not just that the far right are lobbied to by fossil capital, or that does go on. It's that they, in some ways, are the political wing of fossil capital already. Right? They're kind of they're expressive of a certain kind of fossil capital. Um, 
in the political sphere. And I wonder if you think that a tendency towards further centralization, towards in some ways perhaps even the breaking up of the idea that there are these distinct fractions of capital might go some way towards reducing the intensity of the political expressions of capital and tend towards some other way in which uh, par parties relate to blocks of capital. It's perhaps kind of poorly phrased question. I hope it's kind of clear roughly what's going on in that thought. Um, if capital further centralizes, then there are not fractions of capital as distinct interests, which have certain political expressions, but there is the interest of capital in general. And I wonder what, what this does to the, the thesis that you know, both we, you and I, and we rather quote the Palantir's kind of thesis about um, the relationship between uh, capital and, uh, and parties. And as I say, speculative question. I don't know if that's uh, at all useful as a question, but I, I wonder what we'll have to say to that. Laurie? Well, the first thing I'm thinking about is that there generally seems to be a change in how politics uh, is done in a sense like party politics is in decline and people find other ways to be active in politics. But on the other hand, also that you indeed see that that kind of capital powers as companies, um, that they gain more and more power uh, in that sense that you see a tendency towards what, how do you even call that? Like uh, a form of democracy or politics in which companies have a bigger role as in not just lobbying, but actually making politics. I, I think there's a tendency there, but that's my, my initial thought. Yeah, I, I have to say that I haven't really thought about this and or heard this um, idea outlined before. It's an intriguing one. My um, doubt would be about the prognosis that we're sort of moving towards a general centralization. It reminds me of the old monopoly capitalism theory that we're moving towards the end of fierce competition and the capital will become a monolith uh, with a very muted factional conflicts. It's, I, I don't really see that trend, to be honest. I think that we'll continue to be able to distinguish between different fractions. I mean, if you look at US capital, it, there is clearly the kind of Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk sort of digital capital that also is quite fond of things like electrical cars and various technologies that are touted as part of the solution to the climate problem on the one hand and on the other the much more regressive Koch brothers Exxon Mobile sort of capital what is important I think is to not exaggerate the antagonism in, in fundamental interests between those fractions because they are mostly eminently compatible in their interests and add on to each other and supplement each other rather than wage some kind of existential struggle against each other. You can have both of them and, and uh, things will be fine for capital. But as, as distinct fractions, I don't really see them dissolving into a kind of unified uh, BlackRock meta capital, uh, if I understand the thesis correctly. Uh, so I think we should uh, count on a continuous political expression of these various facets of capital in terms of a liberal center uh, in the American sense and uh, a much more obdurate Republican far right, again, in the American sense, as the sort of political faces of these two uh, fractions within capital, if you see what I mean. Uh, I, I haven't discerned any signs of that coming to an end, but I might be behind the curve here. I don't know. No, it's um, that's, that's I, very useful. Yeah, go on, Alex. I, I also um, don't think this centralization thing is a thing. I think the whole point of capitalism is it can accommodate these interests. Um, it can accommodate conflicting fractions together um, and still have this overarching um, system. Um, but what I do, what I would say is that the tendency towards um, international organizations, the expansion of international organizations and the expansion of uh, international capital, truly global capital, feeds into a really kind of obvious far-right narrative of 
uh, you know, globalism versus nativism, nationalism. And I think this is something that's going to come to more and more to the fore in which, you know, we talk about this in the book where um, kind of neoliberal institutions like the UN and the IPCC are, are painted as far left institutions because they're like kind of part of this global uh, infrastructure. Um, and so you have this kind of um, right wing national uh, set against the uh, far left uh, global uh, superstructure. The most uh, e extraordinary example of this is probably Tucker Carlson's um, very famous now picture where he's got, um, he's talking about left-wing companies and they include things like Coke and Nestle. And like, what, does this, what does this mean? Because of course it means a, it means a capital that um, has something like an LGBT recruitment policy or something like that. That's what, that's what by far left. Um, in some ways that is a failure of the left. Uh, not all those things are not important in and of themselves. Yeah, I, I guess so. There are a couple of arguments against the, the thesis I was putting forwards that I would just like to kind of um, express. Um, one is that we've already had investors that were able to hedge their bets, essentially, invest in a bit of fossil fuels, invest in a bit of wind power, invest in a bit of solar power, right? It's a normal investment strategy. It's a, it's a, it's a kind of way of hedging risk. It's a way of hedging your bets. Um, the other thing to say is, of course, that as you, I think, Andreas, put in your um, How to Work pipeline, right? These are not bits of capital you can just kind of turn off. They're not bits of software. They are the material structure of the entire construction of the world, right? You would need to literally rebuild the entire world in order to shift decisively away from fossil fuels. So it's not just that you can, you know, um, turn off the money and then there's no more fossil fuels, right? There's a, there's a much more kind of complicated and in some ways material and rooted problem that needs to be, needs to be solved. I did want to ask, because um, Laura, you mentioned um, people kind of breaking away from party politics. And I wanted to ask what you thought was the position in your account of social movements, um, in the overall account of how important these things, uh, the far right is influencing fossil capital or expressing fossil capital of you know, contesting climate change. What is the role of social movements? Because for, for, for at least my reading, it seemed like the, the book was, was quite deliberately focused on political parties. And because there was, that's where, to be honest, most of the power is most of the time, not all the time, most of the time. And then also uh, talked about uh, terrorists, basically, of, of, of various forms. So I wonder how you see social movements kind of operating in, in that space. There are, of course, exceptions in the book, but yeah, generally, this seems to be the tendency of the, of the writing. Yeah, well, then I would divert from the book. Um, but um, yeah, because still, it is, it is true. I mean, parties do still have the power. And to that extent, we are still living in, in, a, in a world where parties and governments actually make the main decisions. But I do think um, what I was actually mostly referring to was a discussion that I had with my students, which was pretty interesting in that um, I asked about how many people were actually involved in party politics and no one raised their hands. And then I asked like how many people actually attended a protest and everyone raised their hands. So to that extent, um, even though it's no hard proof, I think it kind of shows a tendency towards that people tend to do politics different ways. And I think you can see that on both sides. I mean, movements like, uh, I mean, Greta Thunberg with her uh, Fridays for Future, it's huge. But also on the far right, I think with COVID, you saw uh, all these protests um, of people that were disagreeing with governments on their um, uh, regulations. So to that extent, I think movements play a role in that they show that people are dissatisfied with how things are going. And I think uh, it seems to be more common to that extent, but that that is not what we discuss in the book. It's more of a, yeah, a step outside of the, the book contents. Um, but yeah, what can I, can you, what was the question again? <laughs> Oh, you're muted. How do you see the role of social? Sorry about that. How do you see the role of social movements as I, oh, participating yeah. in this, this expression of the will of fossil capital? Of the expression of the will of fossil capital, I think Maybe that sounds a bit too kind of like, like something's being kind of conjured or something. But like, you know, how do you how do you see the connection? There? Well, in a way, I think that with fossil capital, like right now, it is the general mode of you know economics in a sense like okay capital is fossil right now so to that extent i think movements come up usually whenever they protest against something right so to that extent i think there's a role in for movements whenever 
whoever is in power diverts away from fossil capital because otherwise there is nothing to protest against, I would say, because it's just continuing. Does that make sense what I'm saying? I, I think I think I have a counter example, which maybe Alex can yeah. guess. But, but, um, which, go which ahead. Just, which, which is oh. just, just, just queuing on, but I, I, I'll go to Andreas uh, before. Oh yeah, just very briefly, uh, I'm, I'll make some self-promotion here for the for our collective we have a, a book coming out based on a conference that we did a couple of years back it's a, it's an edited volume with manchester university press called uh, probably um fanning the flames political colleges of the far right and we have there a chapter on the canadian far right well, one which has appeared on the streets fairly recently as a social movement with a freedom convoy that uh, occupied parts of Ottawa. Uh, and before that, you had a, an equivalent of the Yellow Vest movement, or equivalent, rather, a, a response, a Canadian version of it, uh, much more reactionary. And uh, uh, the author of this chapter, he argues that in the Canadian context, and this might uh, appear in other settings as well, it's not so much the biggest companies, but rather more middling forms of fossil capital so oil entrepreneurs and oil companies in canada uh, um, below the highest scale that are most aggressive in forming the backbone of these kind of social movements and uh, canada just like australia is a key country uh, i think to to keep an eye on uh, uh, in the coming years because of the completely oversized role of fossil fuels in their national economies and the uh, uh, intensity of conflicts around fossil fuel projects that you see in both uh, con uh, contexts, and of course the uh, the the settler colonial legacy that completely permeates politics in those two countries. Uh, and here, uh, I mean, as the as climate politics, or or rather the the political conflicts around the climate crisis intensify in Canada and Australia, uh, I I I, I think it's almost inevitable that you will see uh, a far right, uh, I mean, the social movement type of far right playing a role in aggressively defending business as usual uh, with a very strong settler colonial uh, accent to it uh, in, in these places. One of the main ways in which uh, far right movements are constructed now is as kind of diversionary, right? They're not uh, protesting in favor or against a particular social settlement, but they're often protesting against something that is entirely imaginary, right? So in the US, QAnon, for example, has been very good at maneuvering people outside of the framework of conventional client politics. I don't think by and large that QAnon participants or adherents are denialists um, in the conventional sense, right? In some ways they've, they've found a deeper form of denialism. And maybe there's something in the way that you, in your book, touch on what you call carbon vitalism. So carbon vitalism is the idea, um, I'm going to paraphrase this, Car carbon vitalism is, is the idea that CO2, which is of course necessary, as everyone knows, for photosynthesis, is therefore a kind of a, a gas of life, right? It is um, a universal good. So if you have more CO2, all you have is, is, is more of the same thing that is, that is universally good. And the concentration is somehow kind of outside of the framework of, of, of the discussion, right? CO2 is good, therefore more CO2 is good. So there's almost a kind of a, and this is very similar, I was going to say, to the kind of the thought structure of QAnon. Because QAnon sets up this kind of Manichian worldview, things are infinitely good, infinitely bad. And the question exactly of how it is that 415 parts per million, or 416 parts per million, or 417 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, of how that relates to this infinitely good, infinitely bad scheme for thinking about politics, thinking about the world, for constructing a cosmology, I think it just means that it kind of falls outside of... The, uh, the kind of the, the position of, 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 of political thought at all. I wanted to ask Alex about denialism because you, you, you do a great job in the book of going through several different forms of denialism, but I think in some ways denialism can be extended even further. <laughs> so, and, and this is maybe a kind of a, a, one of the things that, um, yeah, it's kind of interesting about social movements is they can construct new forms of, of, of denialism. So Alex, maybe you could kind of uh, give us a, a taste of, of what those new forms of denialism uh, might kind of be like. Uh, uh, what, are you, what are you talking about? So, I mean, so, for example, the, the example I just gave is that we have, uh, and we should just go through the list from the beginning. So we have trend denialism. Okay. We have attribution yeah. denialism. We have, you know, and so on. But then okay. ultimately the list kind of, it goes on and on and on. I think 
one of these, one of the a really interesting and the kind of I wouldn't want to say the final form of denialism because I think you can there's denialism all the way down. But there's always another form, yeah. There's a kind of denialism which ex, which explicitly accepts there is a climate crisis and explicitly accepts that we must do something about it. Um, but things that the things we are doing about it are not good need to be stopped immediately. And we you know we see the expression of this in the net zero study group, um, which is a you know a small collection of Tory MPs, which you know out, go out of their way to say they believe in the climate crisis, believe that there needs to be action, and yet say because of varying excuses that they 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 kind of drag into the conversation, we can't do anything right now. We must start fracking, do shale drilling again. We must start. Um, opening up new oil fields in, in the North Sea. You know, the fuel prices are too high. There's a cost of living crisis. Therefore, we need to drill for oil. Uh, the war in Ukraine is, and and we need to divest ourselves from Russian oil and Europe needs to get rid of it, Russian oil. Therefore, we need to drill for more oil. And it's all, the answer becomes always more and more extraction. Um, and it's this kind of denial, which I think is pretty insidious. And it's link, linked into... Um, very popular concerns about being able to live in the world and be, to be able to exist in it with a relatively stable existence. Um, and, you know, obviously the other expression of that is Nigel Farage's um, net zero, um, new net zero referendum project where he wants a moratorium on, on net zero priorities. And whether he has a success with that is, a, is remains to be seen. You know, it's a, quite a technocratic you know, thing, but he's also had success of um, uh, portraying the you know, kind of technocratic, bureaucratic aspects of governance, i.e., being a membership a member of the EU or not, into very material, very real um, anxieties of the British people of the of the public in general. And um, so, I think, yeah, yeah. So every every crisis is always mediated, right? No one experiences crisis directly. They, I mean. People have substantial crises in their own lives, but even there, they're kind of they're kind of mediated. So there's a um, there, there's a kind of a political expression of crisis, and that political expression can deviate enormously from uh, the underlying structure of the crisis. I think that's that's uh, in the, the extraordinary malleability of that mediation is where we find you know loads of these forms of, of denialism. Alex was just kind of sketching out there. Just to give another kind of really concrete example, um, Le Pen in uh, the debate that they had a few days back um, uh, with M Macron and Le Pen, said that um, Macron said that Le Pen was a climate skeptic, that she didn't really believe in climate change. And M uh, Le Pen, for her part, didn't say that she did believe in climate change. She didn't say that Macron was you know, climate denier either. She said that he was a climate hypocrite. He was the embodiment of a kind of a punitive ecology. And of course, as you were just rightly pointing out, Le Pen knows that will speak to... Um, uh, her voters and many other voters outside of her kind of core constituency, because she has because there is an ongoing crisis of of, of livability uh, in France as there is uh, you know, around the world, to be honest, because of the the policies of partially of, of, of Macron. So I, I wanted to kind of um, go back to uh, some of the questions that we've been given in the audio by the audience. There are some really interesting questions coming through. Please do send some more um, because. And I, this is for this is for Andreas and for Laudi as well, um, which relates to something that Alex was just talking about, which is the war in Ukraine and the effect it's had on fossil capital. So this is a classic crisis, right? You'd think this is a crisis that meant, and some people argue that it is a crisis that means we have to wean ourselves very rapidly off fossil fuels, particularly you know European countries. But it's of course been mediated in other ways. It's been expressed in other ways to give, you know, as Alex was saying, exactly the opposite conclusion. So how do you think that the, the crisis in Ukraine, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, ha will play out into the far right? And the, the questioner also notes that the many of the far right parties in Europe have been at least somewhat um, more supportive of, for example, Putin than anyone on the centre or, 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 or the left has been. So how do you see the dynamics of the Ukrainian crisis kind of playing out in relation to the, the thesis of the book? Or is it just a kind of a uh, thing off to the side, a kind of distraction? Well, the first thing I'm thinking about is actually the whole way that um, the main far-right person in the Netherlands at this point, Thierry Baudet, actually came into politics was because he started this um, referendum in the Netherlands. Uh, I think it was 2013 that the idea emerged. 
or actually the plan was there to sign this trade agreement between Ukraine and um, the EU. And basically, but there, I think it was, there, there was some research in it that he had some uh, Russian contacts and started this campaign against this trade agreement. So to that extent, he is only um, continuing this path. Uh, I briefly looked today at his Twitter feed and can indeed see that uh, he now campaigns to actually not host Ukrainian refugees uh, in the Netherlands, but only local. So to that extent, um, yeah, I can only speak for the Dutch situation that I'm familiar with, but there, um, it's hard to say why it actually is. It's a very good question. I I guess we haven't we we haven't kind of yet we haven't yet kind of found out right like it's a it's an ongoing crisis there will be many more um, many thing, more things will happen before we we have any kind of conclusive answer. Yeah. Andreas, any thoughts on that? No, I'm I'm I have to say I'm extremely weak on this whole uh, crisis. Uh, I I, um, I don't really know Russian politics or uh, have any deeper insights into this war, but the trend in Sweden, and I would assume that this goes for Finland as well, because they are in a similar position, or we, is a very much one where you have an aggressive um, militarization of the political discourse and a suddenly uncontrollable urge to join uh, the NATO alliance. <clears throat> this doesn't benefit the organized far right in the short term. So actually, the Sweden Democrats, the the far, main far right party here in Sweden, is uh, dropping in the polls right now. But in the longer run, we know that war and uh, the militarization of politics tend to be conducive to far right mindsets. I mean, obviously, the whole classical period of fascism was an outcome of the First World War, uh, and. Uh, the I'm, my fear here, obviously, is that the Ukrainian war will uh, kind of some pretty nasty tendencies in uh, nationalist uh, politics that doesn't necessarily have to come from the you know explicitly self-identified far right, but can come from the depths of the of the mainstream of the center, and this is certainly the case in Sweden where. Uh, a latent uh, fear of Russia uh, is deeply anchored in, in, in the political history of this country and it can, uh, you know, uh, reappear as we have to protect our nation and, and pour our money into uh, uh, an arms race or arms build up and, and join up with the US and in, in NATO and things like that. <clears throat> As for the energy aspect of it, there there was a moment early on in the war when you had the sense, uh, somewhat similar to the early stage of the pandemic, that this could be an opportunity to shift finally away from fossil fuels to become independent of Russia and move towards renewables. What we see is rather, again, that opportunity being squandered and reinvestment in fossil fuels along the lines of the Tory government planning to accelerate uh, extraction in the North Sea or Germany going on this building spree of uh, liquefied natural gas terminals to replace Russian gas with gas from somewhere else rather than moving towards uh, renewable uh, renewable powers. And these, these two trends of sort of uh, non-Russian, in the best case, national, as, as in the UK, reinvestment in fossil fuels and a militarization of politics in the long run uh, will benefit the right far, far more than the left, uh, obviously. Yeah, that's certainly an aspect that I think that we we try and be attentive to in thinking about not just uh, clashes between the US and and Russia or Europe and Russia or you know, uh, anyone in Russia indeed, um, but also between the, role, the the changing and shifting role of of China, uh, not only as a kind of a uh, competitive nation to to the US in a kind of a, Reju rejuvenated Cold War dynamic, but also as a kind of a, I don't know, something like a um, an exemplar to some extent, right? China has been very uh, effective at um, instigating or using um, environmental controls in various ways, even as its uh, political economy has uh, been kind of immensely destructive 
in, in, in other ways. And maybe like, how do we, or how, how do you, Alex, see um, this kind of emerging dynamic between uh, the, you know, this kind of new Cold War, even if it, as it extends kind of beyond the immediate crisis in Ukraine, perhaps into the kind of the, the, the late 21st century, um, working between the US and, and, and maybe China or Europe and China or whoever you want and, uh, and China, I guess. Like what role do you think China will play in the relationship between forest and, the cli and climate change? Will it be an exemplar? Will it be a kind of a, a, a competition? Will it be a threat and so on? I think it's most likely to um, um, take on the role of a, of a threat or a competitor nation and a, a threat to white power, uh, you know, white geopolitical power, sorry, um, uh, in the world. Um, but of course, I think it's, it's hard to, I'm a bit wary about kind of projecting too far like that, I think. I think the new Cold War dynamic is one that we need to be aware of and to be watching, um, but I don't really have much more on that. I think. I think. I think the important thing I was kind of aiming at is the um, is is the, the the appeal of environmental authoritarianism. And maybe this is kind of as Andreas was saying, like there's a kind of a uh, in some ways there's a kind of a, a collection of far ideas that emerge quite kind of smoothly out of the mainstream. And I think environmental authoritarianism possibly the kind of a military edge of some description, is one of the abiding temptations of the climate crisis as a whole. The argument is very simple. So far, we've had democracy. Democracies have failed to rapidly decarbonize. Therefore, we need authoritarianism, right? That's a very simple argument. In some ways, it's a very compelling argument on a completely superficial level. How should we be responding to this kind of provocation, this kind of argument uh, you know, going forwards? What, what is important about, to maintain about democracy if there is something important to maintain about democracy? I know, Andreas, you've written about eco leninism Perhaps you could kind of speak to uh, that. You want me to speak about ecological Leninism? I'd love you to speak about ecological Leninism. <laughs> well, it would take us a bit off track. That's okay. Uh, yeah, well, but, but on the question of democracy, I mean, the idea of ecological Leninism is... It's formulated in a somewhat different register, but it, I mean, it's and and I should say also that it's it's an idea that not only I have toyed with, but other comrades as well. And we have all of us. I'm thinking here of Jody Dean and Kai Heron, Derek Wall. All of us have um, t you know used various aspects of the Leninist legacy and and. Uh, experimented with to what extent they can be useful for the present. My, my own extremely rough sketch uh, for something like this focused on the, the central Leninist gesture, if you like, during the uh, Ur catastrophe of the 20, 20th century, the, the First World War, of trying to turn uh, a crisis of symptoms into a crisis of, for the causes. So the First World War being uh, a war, uh, a major catastrophe, fueled by dominant classes bent on perpetual expansion. And the Leninist argument was that, that, that if you want peace for the long term, you have to transform this crisis into a revolutionary crisis where you topple those dominant classes and get rid of them and uh, replace them with another form of class power that isn't beholden to imperialist expansion because otherwise we'll just end up having one war of this kind after another, which was a pretty accurate uh, prediction. <clears throat> and, and the equivalent of that today would be to try to transform moments of climate disaster when you have uh, the impact striking into crises for the drivers. So. When the next flood hits Germany, for instance, we shouldn't, uh, you know, we shouldn't join the choir of saying, as as even the Greens did last summer, that now we have to learn to adapt to these floods and beef up our protection or something like that, but rather try to transform these moments into crises for the sources that bring us more and more of these disasters. So the, the Leninist gesture in these, on, these, on these occasions would be, well, look, if we continue, if, to take the German case, if we continue to take up lignite coal, uh, 
the, the dirtiest fossil fuels of all, uh, we will just have more and more of these floods. So if you worry about these floods, well, then stop lignite coal. Or, you know, this could, of course, be applied to any kind of climate disaster in virtually any kind of country. And uh, it's, a very, it's a very simple strategic idea that is, in a sense, just total common sense or, you know, the ABCs of climate science that, that uh, uh, if, we don't, if we don't address the sources, we'll just have more and more of the, of the, of the symptoms. But uh, it's one that aligns... Uh, strongly with one part of the Leninist legacy uh, that that uh, would be useful today. I mean, we, you could you could say a ton of other things about it as well. When it when it comes to democracy, uh, I I don't I wouldn't see a project of ecological Leninism or anything of that kind of sort of transitional program as a limitation of democracy. To the contrary, it would would have to be a massive expansion and deepening of democracy. Most importantly, by exercising public control that is potentially democratic control over the fate of the planet, as in taking over fossil fuel companies and putting them under under state control, so you don't have billionaires on the loose making the key decisions about what energy sources will use, and thereby having a completely undemocratic mandate to decide whether we're going to burn the rest of this planet uh, or not. Uh, but rather, you know, democratize energy uh, structures and investment decisions and put these uh, companies uh, under some kind of collective control. So that to me would be a, a, an expansion or a contraction of democracy. It's worth saying as well that this argument for environmental authoritarianism often relies on a, I think, direct, straightforwardly false kind of uh, postulate, which is that there are kind of elite environmental people, uh, elite environmentalists who are have the fate of the planet, they can kind of think long term and so on. They, they care about the environment. And then there are the kind of slovenly masses uh, who don't care about the planet and refuse to change their ways. And of course, nothing could be further from the truth. There could be no formulation of the of the of the relationship between these two groups of people that was more false. Um, overwhelmingly, what has happened when people have been given even quite limited democratic control. Uh, there are examples of this in France, examples of this in the US as well, where you give people information about the climate crisis. You say, these are options. Overwhelmingly, they opt for the most radical of uh, climate politics. And then um, what happened, for example, in France was that there was a, a list of very radical proposals given by this, this uh, People's Assembly um, to the Macron government at the Macron government's uh, request. And Macron said, no, nope, can't do any of that. But it's not that we're suffering from an excess of democracy, but that we're suffering from a kind of a, a mode of democracy that is, is chained by property, uh, chained by fossil fuel capital, uh, and, and prevented from, from being properly kind of democratic. Um, we've got a couple more questions I wanna, I'm going to ask you guys, uh, and then we're going to wrap up. But if you have more questions, keep going with them, and I will, I will definitely uh, come to them if we have, have time. I also wanted to say one other thing, which is that I love the idea of moving from a crisis of symptoms to a crisis of the cause. It's a great, great slogan. Uh, Laudy, do you have anything particularly you wanted to say on the question of, of authoritarianism, or shall I move on? Well, I was just quickly thinking, like, if we accept the idea that companies have a big role to play in democracies right now, um, what we can see is, okay, we all can vote for governments, but indeed, these companies that do have a certain amount of power, they are not democratic. So to that extent, indeed, you can make that more democratic kind of alludes to and what Andreas was saying also. But that was my only yeah. thought on that, yeah. Alex? You are muted, Alex. Did, oh, sorry. <laughs> That's fine. Am I muted? I'm not muted. No, you're not, go on. All right. Hey, some, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, confusing. Um, people have this idea of, of, of the state as, as if only the right people were in charge, then you know we could just do whatever we wanted, and everything would uh, would would fall into place. And of course, that's a fairly extremely naive view. I think where we would the the place to make demands, I would echo what other people have said, the place to make demands in mass movements, um, building um, you know building big mass actions and big mass movements uh, that can force the issue to the extent where it becomes undeniable. So look at things like. Um, and I'm using the UK because that's my best reference point. Look at things like Insulate Britain, which was, you know, um, condemned by some parts of, I suppose, the left, um, definitely condemned by the mass of centre and the right. And yet, you know, 
insulating a, ma a campaign of mass insulation is, is now a really viable alternative to drilling for more oil in response to the cost of li living crisis and needs to be pushed harder. Um, even as a matter of um, putting an option undeniably within uh, the sphere of political possibility, there was good in that in, the, in those actions that Insulate Britain did. Yeah, I want, I want to come to the question of social movements, actually, uh, not from the right, but from the left, uh, social movements against uh, against the climate crisis, um, and ask about kind of ending Orlando and uh, the Keystone Pipeline and all these kind of quite like famous actions. Uh, there's also a question down here, which is how are social movements like Extinction Rebellion in danger of inadvertently promoting a pathway to eco-fascism? Perhaps that's a question for, for Alex and I, but if anyone else has any kind of thoughts on that or the thoughts on the role of social movements in getting us out of this this crisis is there a like is that the basis of eco ecological Leninism, or is that a kind of a, a kind of a false path I don't know. so alex or... uh, i i mean i i think uh in the case of Ex extinct rebellion i think they have improved uh, their politics a fair degree uh, as they've diversified in different campaigns like a stop oil for example um and I think we need to be supporting, you know, Just Stop Oil is facing a lot of police repression right now. Um, you know, there was a raid on a social centre in London. There's been more raids and arrests in Nottingham recently um, in the past few days. And I think that um, we should stand in solidarity with them um, against this state repression. I think the danger comes when um, we have a kind of environmental movement that's devoid of uh, a wider left politics of class as well and uh, a politics anti-fascism and I think we need to start embedding um, politics of anti-fascism within ecological movements like Extinct Rebellion more than it's being happened already. Is there a concrete way you're just doing that or is there a, there a, is that a more kind I mean, of speculative strategic question? I don't know. Like, <laughs> no, it's a enormous question. No, I, I've just kind of thrown at you and uh I think I think the idea of, of movements coming together is an important one as well. Like I think we need to start um, looking at ecological movements as things that need to be defended, will need to be defended more and more by um, forces of reaction. And so it almost comes to a point where it becomes a matter of necessity rather than how do we conceive of clever ways of doing it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. So the, the question was about social movements and their, their role in... Uh... Uh, preventing uh, uh, further disaster, and do you think there are there's the possibility of a kind of a reactionary? Let's perhaps not use the eco fascist. It's kind of like a vague term in some ways. The book is about the vagueness of the term rather than about the term itself. Um, although we do have things we call eco fascists in the book. Do you see there as a kind of possibility or a threat of a kind of far right movements in the climate change? Where do you see that, that, that possibility and threat? And how should left movements, in some ways, inoculate themselves or prevent that from that kind of that kind of capture? Laudi or Andreas? Well, I've been thinking about the question. I saw it passing by, and I like when I really look at the question itself about extinction rebellion and to what extent they might go to some eco-fascist uh, state, I think they can't technically. Because if I take your um, like uh, definition of fascism from your book, which I have here, like fascism is a political form that seeks to revolutionize and reharmonize the nation state through expelling a radically separate other by para paramilitary means. So if you don't think about Extinction Rebellion, first of all, they're not about the nation state, are they? I mean, it's an international organization to that extent. So they already do not match that idea. And secondly, don't they have like citizen, no, what is it called? Like citizen, citizen assemblies? In a yes. way that they have this very radical idea about actually democrat, uh, democratizing their organization. So to that extent, it kind of also does not tick that box. So, so I don't think that, <laughs> but maybe that's a very, very simplistic thought, but that's my initial thought. So I, th I think the question is that uh, is the question of whether or not they are in danger of promoting a pathway to eco-fascism. So I'll just read out the full question. How are social movements like Extinction Rebellion in danger of inadvertently, promo inadvertently is also kind of important, promoting a pathway to eco-fascism if they are 
at all. I do think it's a kind of interesting and, and provocative question in some ways. Um, Ecofascism here, uh, I'm going to suggest, is probably a slightly nebulous term for a kind of environmentalism that is shorn of demands for social justice. Um, that kind of capacious definition of ecofascism, which I, I wouldn't use, but I think it's kind of a useful thing to think about. That kind of capacious definition of ecofascism, I can totally see something like Extinction Rebellion, not Extinction Rebellion itself, tending towards um, forms of inequitable settlement. One of the ways in which this might kind of play out most, uh, I guess, strongly is in the contradiction between the need for a green transition and the needs to extract uh, enormous amounts of lithium uh, rare earth minerals and so on from different parts around uh, the world, overwhelmingly, which are not in uh, Western countries, apart from Australia, which has lots of lithium. So there's a there's a, there's a kind of a, a tension there. Um, you know, yes, we are destroying your uh, natural environment. Yes, we are perhaps you know, brutalizing your population in order to extract this lithium, but it's for the good of everyone and so on. And I can see that kind of argument being played out in the future. Andreas is begging to come in here. Come on, go on. Give us a... Yeah. To me, to me, this has very little to do with fascism. To me, this sounds totally like just liberal mainstream uh, yes. environmentalism. So yeah. if you define something that could come out of XR-like movements as climate struggle shorn of the demand for social justice, then that would fit totally with the liberal mainstream. But it, it doesn't have a, a fascist quality to it, as far as I can see. For that, something else would be needed. So I totally agree with both Alex and Laudi. My answer to this question would be a very simple and straightforward no. I don't see XR being in danger of either advertently or inadvertently promoting a pathway to ecofascism, other than potentially by eliciting a backlash from the far right. I mean, and obviously anyone who escalates the climate struggle, as I'm advocating that, that we should be doing, risks to an extent, eliciting a far-right response because, you know, if people were to start blowing up pipelines... Someone Alex, is, could you mute? Yeah. You could easily see, you know, I don't know, far-right vigilante starting to patrol these pipelines and uh, having a go at the left for being terrorists or something like that. Uh, but that's that's a, that's a completely different thing. Uh, when, you, when you have a polarization around climate politics, uh, you... Uh, of, of course, uh, give a certain kind of ammunition to your enemy, just like the BLM uprising after the murder of George Floyd boosted a certain kind of far-right response. That's in the nature of political antagonism, right? Uh, but uh, no, I don't see... I mean, oh, of course, there's been a... Uh, mostly, I would say, fairly lazy left critique of XR for, in some instances, of particular individuals, you know... Uh, adopting Malthusian sounding rhetoric, but I think these are fairly isolated cases. And I agree with Alex that XR has really, really, just as Fridays for Future, uh, by the way, uh, moved to the left in their political discourse. And we should totally embrace uh, Just Stop Oil as a very important step forward and hope for more uh, uh, offshoots of that kind. Uh, so uh, I, I'm, I'm sort of a little bit tired of this kind of left critique of XR that was formulated back in 2019 and that has become somewhat obsolete, I, I would say. Yeah, I, I would like to echo that again. Like that, this is um, a critique that's misplaced for this year. You know, this is how out of date it is. Um, I, I think there's a tendency to be condemning movements rather than engaging with and improving. And, and XR hasn't even needed left engagement to improve itself over you know the last few years. So you know, yeah, yeah. I, I would I would also echo uh, everything that's been been said so so far. Um, okay, so the, the, the there's one further question that I want to get to, which is uh, the question is fascism is mostly reactionary. And I think by that the questioner means that it emerges. In relation to a crisis or in relation to something else, for example, World War One, 1929, Great Depression, and so on. Great Depression, sorry, not Great Repression, different thing. Do we see eco-fascists in the coming crisis, or are we more likely to see them rise following a catastrophic environmental failure? So, I have to take some sort. Of, I've asked the question first, and then I pass it on. Um, we have to take some responsibility, of course, for uh, propagating the use of the term eco-fascism. But I should say, as as Laudy just defined, uh, the way we define ecofascism in the book uh, 
is as, um, I'm going to see if I can do the whole definition all at once, um, a, a, a form of political behavior that seeks to homogenize and cleanse a racially pure nation state by paramilitary means. Did I get it right? Good. Yes. So, so fascism is a very exceptional form of political act activity. And we define eco-fascism as being like quite an exceptional form of fascism as well. In some ways, eco-fascism is a, a useful marketing device. It's a useful way of, of, of getting people to engage with the collection of ideas that you're talking about. But I would very strongly encourage a kind of a more, in some ways, variegated political vocabulary. I think it's useful to have much more precise and much more well-defined terms that are differentiated. Environmental authoritarianism, you know, as I was saying a moment ago, environmentalism shorn of the disarmament of racial justice, as Andreas says, that could be totally compatible with liberalism. You know, the kinds of terms we use in the book are, I think, slightly more kind of useful than the, than the idea of, of, of eco-fascism uh, in particular. There are lots of uh, other questions I want to get to or kind of look at in the text, see if people have thoughts. People are expressing uh, agreements the cross, for the cross-fertilization of movements, uh, linking climate struggles to things like racism, war, the cost of living, and so on, all of which they suggest are um, pr uh, protective when it comes to building support for anti-fascism. It's absolutely the case. Yeah. Um, there's a Malthusian thinking in XR. I think that's 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 being being covered so far. Um, yes, possibly in the past. I think uh, as I hope, I think Andrea was and Andreas was saying that's hopefully uh, kind of shifted away and is now kind of more uh, more kind of right on. Does anyone have any other things I want to say before we wrap up here? Any final points? Any last thoughts? Uh, and so on. If not, uh, go on. Let me just say that th this conversation has to continue because developments on the ground will, will uh, if, again, I think I've used this word many too many times already, but inevitably, uh, new things will happen. Uh, the, the the situation is so volatile, and the disasters are coming thick and fast. And the far right will be part of the picture. Uh, so we should continue to keep track of developments and uh, be vigilant as anti-fascists. Absolutely, yes, that that is uh, absolutely the case. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you for your really excellent questions, uh, even the ones we disagreed with as questions. Alex, did you something to say you wanted to get in before we go? Loud? Uh, no, it's all great. Good. Lari? I know. I just suddenly thought about actually a comment that you made in the book, Sam and Alex, about you know um, fascism. That at a certain point we have to start thinking about the fact that fascism. Okay, we have we had fascism in the past, but fascism in the future might look some somewhat different than what we've seen in the past. So to that extent, concerning the question of uh, the fascism being mostly reactionary, I think, or like uh, when or how we would see fascism in the future i think you make a fairly good point in the book saying that we have to think about fascism in multiple ways and not only seeing it as like how we saw it in the past so to that extent that we have to keep our eyes open and i thought that is a good point one very brief point i'll make on that is that it's it's, it's very useful to think about fascism as, as stemming not from just from a kind of objective crisis of capitalism but from a subjective and kind of total crisis that overwhelms all the people who are embedded in capitalism as well which is of course everyone um and so but the way that subjective crisis manifests now and the way it's subject it manifested in the 1920s and 30s is totally different and therefore the the kind of underlying psychological structure of fascism will be completely different now when we live in a time when people are kind of compelled to become entrepreneurs of the self rather than to identify strictly as nationalists or communists or socialists or liberals inside a kind of a, uh, a mass society. So there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a kind of distinction there between uh, the construction of societies and the kinds of variants of fascism or not fascism they are capable of um, uh, giving rise to. Someone has asked that an environmental, someone suggested that an environmental tyrant to stop all pollution might work. I think we covered it successfully. No, it wouldn't. It wouldn't work. Um, it would It would be a disaster, not only for uh, the attempt, authoritarian governments overwhelmingly ecologically destructive, um, it would be a disaster for the environment and it would be a disaster for all the humans who, who lived in it. Only remains to say thank you very much to to Alex, to Andreas, to Laudi. Uh, thank you to Polity. Thank you to the World Transform. Thank you to Verso for promoting the event. And I will see you all.
very soon. Thank you very much for coming. It's been uh, really great. Thank you for the questions. Bye. Thank you.